the Battle of Press and Pans, there's Big Duncan Mackenzie, was a Jacobite. Spun around and a trooper on horseback was coming straight for him. So on the pass, Big Duncan made a cut at the boy's head and it deflected off his helmet. And it, the trooper's helmets were much like a riding hat but made of iron. And it deflected off and he knew the next one had to be better. So he looks and he sees the remains of a small wall, a wee dyke behind him. And he stands on it and he beckons on the trooper again and as the trooper comes passing him again the second time. He leaps up off the wall and he gave it everything. Poof, a belter right to the boy's head. So his whole body weight in his arm was behind the momentum of that sword as well. And it cut and it split the head and the helmet fully in two. Poof, so he drops it. Well, he picks up the two bits of helmet and he says, it may be this will cause talk yet. Chose after Preston Pans to go back home to Lochaber, as some of the Jacobites did. And he's making his way back home with two friends. And they get to the west coast at a place called Inveroran and they spy some of the Argyle militia, some of the Redcoat troop. He's captured and he's taken prisoner. And he's taken to the castle at Kilhern at the head of Loch Awe, and there's going to be a trial. But word of that and his capture gets back to Cameron of Loch whose regiment he's in and one of Lochiel's daughters was married to Campbell at the time and she sent her husband to go and speak on behalf of Big Duncan at his trial to help secure his freedom. So that happened on the day but he was allowed his freedom only on one condition that he had to swear to that he would never raise arms for Prince Charlie again. And his sword was taken from him and his sword was taken to Inverary Castle where it had been there since 1745 because it was the 8th Duke of Argyll in the mid-19th century that commissioned the Dewar manuscripts to be written, which was a collection of Gaelic historic lore from all over his lands in Argyll at the time. And in that, there's a chapter on Big Dump Mackenzie. And that's the only reason we know the detail of that story still. I usually offer an email to Scottish stately homes and castles. Well, refurbishment work is good and interesting work. And only one got back to us, and that was Argyll. I had to first ask if he was familiar with the story and he wasn't, he hadn't heard it. So the two, the sword and the story had become separated over time. I think I'll take a, a wee look around the Jackaway baskets just now, see if there's any sword that stands out actually as uh, Duncan Duncan's. I mean, you know, we, when, we had, when we had the fire here in 1975, we lost a lot of stuff. Alright, well, yes, a lot of stuff. Okay. Because the whole of the top floor was used as storage. And a lot of the stuff that was there, be it furniture, be it pictures, whatever, right. was lost. Right. So basically what we've got is what you see on display here. Okay. And if there was something like a, a sword with that sort of history, mm -hmm. I would probably know about it. Mm -hmm. right. And I don't. Mm -hmm. you know, over the years I would have heard of something like that. You know, mm -hmm. If something had a good story. And then none of these have any particular outstanding story. Because that, that story is recorded in the Dewar manuscripts. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, by all means, I'll have a look, have a place to look. But yeah. I don't see anything with any great big dents in it. <laughs> it was disappointing not to find an obvious candidate for. Uh, the Preston Pans story, um, and, but as he says, it was quite likely lost in that fire. Uh, a lot, a lot of them seem to have been, and yeah, could well have be lost. Well, the collection that we have here is one of the sort of the larger private collections in Scotland. Um, now, this castle was built; they started to build it in 1746, and a lot of the weapons that you have here on display a brown vest muskets, halberds, swords that would have been used at the Battle of Culloden, which was obviously the last uh, pitched battle in Scotland. So, you know, they've got a great age to them. They've had an amazing history uh, and they've been on display in the castle in the same way that they are for as long as I know. 
and um, you know they've been through fires, they've been through many different things. But I think you know the time is now to give them a little bit of love and attention to make sure they last for many years to come. It was really quite special seeing the collection up close and uh, seeing the variety of weapons. Take an example, an example of one musket from the collection and uh, one bayonet, uh, basically to give me a practical idea of how long it's going to take uh, to do one piece to the, the, the standards that, that's required for the speak. Um, for some of the other weapons, such as swords, I have experience in doing these before, I can work out an approximate time for them. The opportunity to refurbish this collection, I see that as a privilege because it's, yeah, history in your hands. Uh, a friend had come over and he's an, an armourer in the, in the mm. army and so I thought well I'll find a, a Jacobite one for myself and I thought he's got a clean government sword you know he has to uh, work on a, an army piece um, so he was working on that and the brass hilt and had the Jacobite piece but I, I brought this piece out as well uh, I'm not sure why maybe I thought we'd, we'd maybe get through another sword after that um, and I got this out thinking, well, here's, a, here's an old one that's, that's in its grip and so on, just needs a bit of work, you know. I didn't think too much of it, um, but it was as we were telling the story uh, of Big Duncan McKenzie and Preston Pans. And she was sitting right in front of us all the while. <laughs> Great stuff. Great stuff. I cleaned it. I've done all the work in the hilt. The hilt's actually been, it's, well, it's, it's funny, it's, it's plain. It's thin sheet steel, basically. It's only about two millimetre thick. Um, there's what appears to be possibly a G down here, which Glasgow makers often stamp their hilts with. Um, it's a fairly plain basket, but it's been silver plated. It's got traces of copper, and the co copper is often applied first to steel before silver plating. Um, and it appears to be silver plated over that. This bright shining, it's not steel here, this is, this is uh, silver. Um, I'm looking closer at it because it's deteriorated quite a bit. There are some lines of decoration that it's had at, at, at one point, originally. Um, so it's fairly, fairly plain, but it's, it's had a nice bit of bling uh, to it. Um, and it was after I'd you know, cleaned up the hill, cleaned up the blade, um, and I was really applying the wax to it at the end. And I had the blade this way, uh, and, and the, the, the blunted section stood out, and I think the light caught it, and, and my thought is, why, why is it so blunt around here? You know? And then I looked closer at it and thought, it's not just blunt, it's actually deformed and warped like this. And, and then I saw the edge had rolled both sides and straight away I, I thought, that's, that's it. It appears to be uh, the legend. So I went back to the story that evening um, and from the wording of the, the legend it's, it's quite clear. It says uh, there was a blunting of the edge of the sword corresponding to the split of the helmet. And if you were to split a helmet in two, it's, it's exactly what you would what you would find, what you would uh, expect. And I say being in this area, close closer to the hand, where the blade's a wee bit thicker, probably saved the blade from breaking in two. If it had been subject to the same force in this area, then with the blade much thinner, probably a broken. Easy. So aye, it's all there. Uh, all come together. That and the fact that it is a big basket, you know, it's a sizable basket for a large hand. Uh, all ties in, you know. Great stuff. So it was quite special to find again that was the sword of Big Duncan Mackenzie. But before taking it back to Inverary, I took the sword to Preston Pans back for the first time since the battle. Crossed it with the sword of a red coat trooper on the monument, and it was then taken to Kilhern Castle again. But then it was taken to uh, Eilin Mundi, a wee island in Loch Leven, where Big Duncan was laid to rest. One of the members of Conflicts, um, Colin McDougall, who uh, 
who popped into the armory one day and he said, do you know where Big Duncan was, was buried? And I didn't. And so he opens a great book that has an image of his gravestone with the, the carving. And he says, there you go. So he had a reference as to where it was, and it was Eelan Mundy, it was this island. Traditional burial isle of at least the McDonald's and Stuarts of Appen and uh, the surrounding areas. Um, I believe the McDonald chief who was murdered in the massacre of Glencoe was uh, he was laid to rest there as well. Um, so it's been a burial ground for centuries there, and uh, we had to make the pilgrimage uh, out there and uh, at least for a short while return the sword to its original owner. And there's an incredible big long stone, beautifully carved with script, and at the base of the stone is a deep image of Big Duncan standing in his kilt with his targe, with his bunnet, his big nose and his son with his sword and he's splitting the head of the red coat trooper into still carved on his stone to this day. So we took it back there first and had a wee ceremony to remember Big Duncan and his actions. It takes us all away but it brings us all together. And the sword is long played its part in that. Let's look for McKinney. The United was messed up. Briefly all the same. So that did it. And by that, he got his name. When I took the sword back to Inverary, he said, oh, he he says, that's great, thanks very much. He'd be happy to display the sword, he says, exclusively with the story, uh, which is good. Well, I mean, you're, you're right, that, that doesn't, doesn't really deserve to just be stuck back up on the wall, does it? I mean, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good story. <laughs> a very good story. A bit of legend, and it says, thanks to the 8th Duke, that he commissioned the Dewar Manuscript. Yeah, 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 Well, I never. <laughs> Better mark that one, just in case I forget. <laughs> Aye, so Argyle's ancestor was responsible for the story itself continuing, but it was his uh, grandson that was responsible for ensuring the, the carving that was carved in stone. So his story still kept alive and uh, by paper and by stone and by steel.